Greetings ladies and managers, and welcome to this latest video for Retreat Hell, taken from the subreddit HFY. The link to the original is down below, and if you enjoy the story, head over there and let the author know. If you wish to support this channel, there are many ways to do so, also, strangely enough, listed down below. Don't forget to subscribe, or we'll have a platoon of angry cat-like creatures attacking you in your sleep. Anyways, on to the sci-fi. Retreat Hell, Chapter 17, Part 1 So you met Corporals Kowalski and Kimber, Lance Corporal Steffens, and Private Gomez outside the city. Not at the brothel, Army Staff Sergeant Blass said, griping out at a laptop. That is correct. It took a lot of willpower for Bradford to not bring a hand to pinch the bridge of her nose. I met up with them as I was approaching a truck of food of Lieutenant Washbourne was overseeing. Who else did you meet there? I met the rest of the squad there or on the walk from the city. And what happened once you? The MP's question was interrupted by a flap of the tent room being pulled open. Staff Sergeant, the Army Sergeant leaned in. The chain of command is here to take them. The curtain was pulled further aside by Captain Spader as he marched into the room. Both she and Blas popped to attention. Sergeant Bradford, do not answer any more questions. Muster out front with First Sergeant. Do not speak to anyone, including your squad, except as necessary to follow instructions and report their completion. Do you understand? Sir, yes sir, Bradford said, holding herself at attention. Then move it, Sergeant. Aye aye, sir, Bradford said, and quick marched past the Captain CO. The Marine Corps will conduct its own investigation from here, Staff Sergeant, she heard him say before she was out of earshot. Thank God for that rescue, she thought, though the look on the Katrae's face as she stepped out of the army field tent confirmed that she already knew this was not going to be fun. She spent the rest of the trip back with Tolkien silently reflecting on how badly she'd fecked up. What was your group doing yesterday? Kowalski leaned back in his chair. He's relaxed this interest, not quite towering the line of being disrespectful. We went exploring the town, checking out the local businesses, and had a couple drinks. How many drinks did you have? A couple, he shrugged. We were on liberty, but we ain't that far from the front at all. You were you intoxicated when Sergeant Bradford contacted you? Not really even buzzed, he shook his head. The Kishman stuff's good enough, but uh, he reached up and rubbed the back of his head. It's not as strong as you'd expect. You were Liberty Buddies with Corporal Samson, correct? Yes, Master Sergeant. And what did you and Corporal Samson do after you separated from the rest of your squad? We went shopping. You were shopping for souvenirs? Yes, Master Sergeant. And where were you when Second Artificer Yacht was detained? The market. We started off trading with a bunch of random stuff we bought with the exchange for local money. Turns out Shields is pretty good at haggling. Set us up pretty well. Shields? A yacht, Edison said. We call him Shields because uh, he's good with them, you know. I see. Go on. So after we all split, I was Dubois, Alda, and Davies, he frowned. Nobody really wanted to hang out with Davies, but somebody had to, and it's usually best to keep him separate from Kowalski's group. Why's that? They, uh, don't get along. And Davies is a snitch. Lance Corporal Miller was your liberty buddy, correct? He and I went shopping, see? We both wanted to check out the local fashion scene, right? Uh, I wanted some new outfits, uh, something exotic, you know. And Miller, he wanted to get something for his old lady, and his little bean sprout. So, you went shopping after you separated with the rest of your squad? Oh, absolutely. We were all over the market, trying on hats, modeling for dresses, trying on different fabrics. Now, my fashion sense is atrocious, mind you, but Miller, he's a style savant. I let him dress me every time we go out. So you tried on clothes, Staff Sergeant said, typing into his computer. Not just clothes, Sansom waved his hands between them. We tried on jewelry and shoes, handbags, purses, all sorts of things. I don't think the specifics of what you browsed are important, the Staff Sergeant said, adjusting his seat. Did you encounter any of the other groups before you got to Bradford's tax message? And what happened after you met with Sergeant Bradford? Ah, shit got gnarly. I usually try not to disrupt the zen when I'm on liberty, you know. But Jams, man, she was seriously off a cool and, uh, I mean, uh, like of course she was, man. Because these seriously unchill cats took shields, right? 
So, like, I'm just trying to maintain my chill. But at that point, I'm totally ready to unchill if the situation calls for it. You know what I'm saying, bruh? I realized something was up, so I sent out the mass text, then headed for the edge of town. You did so by yourself. Why didn't you link up with the nearest member of your squad? I, uh... Bradford paused, blinking. I didn't think about that, so asked the sergeant. Bro, dude, we all spent like an hour crapping our brains out. Elder brought his, both his hands down flat in front of him. That galanzi was good as feck, but too much of it will clean you out like a drunk date with a bad Mexican food. It didn't hit right away. It took another hour or two before the piper came to claim his due. But when he did... He raised his hands. Oh, boy. It hit like vengeance, and Davies had it worse. Keep the stuff on everything he ate. He shook his head. He'd only just finished his third trip to the head when we got Bradford's text. Is there anyone that can corroborate your story when just you and Sergeant Bradford were together? Rin cocked an ear. My uncle Ewan, he said. We walked into his shop purely by accident. I didn't know he was still alive. We talked with him for some time, and he directed me to the shop where I found my things and where I, uh... His ears twitched back, where I, uh... was abducted. After we got Sergeant Bradford's text, we did a quick head count for the group and then headed to the main road in the city. We didn't run into any issues along the way and met up with the rest of the squad maybe 30, 40 minutes after we got the text. We ran into Kowalski's group and Miller and Stephens about the same time, right as we were reaching the edge of the city proper. We ran into Bradford and Lieutenant Washburn's team shortly after that. And what happened after that, Corporal? Dubois rolled his hands in a shrug that barely touched his shoulders. We proceeded to the Gannon army camp and pushed our way inside. His mouth twitched into a small frown. I suppose we technically ran the guard post, but if we hadn't showed up when we did, Shields, I mean, uh, second artificer Yacht, would have been dead. Dude, she stared down the Keshman officer like he was some new boot and he didn't know how to put his face on straight. Shit was badass, Kimber leaned forward. Then she noticed the hangman dude was leaning on the rope, trying to quietly strangle Shields while everyone was distracted. She didn't even flinch. She pointed Miracle's pistol at the Shields' CO and told him she'd shoot him in the eye. He didn't stop. And then what happened? The dude stopped! Kimber leaned back, crapped all over his guy for what he was doing too, made it sound like it was a recurring problem. He leaned forward again. See, the way the hanging works, it's not really supposed to be strangling. None right, the drop breaks your neck, and that's what kills you. None wrong, though, and you strangle. It's what they called the dancing the jig back in the day, he grimaced. Nasty way to go. He shook his head and leaned back. The way the officer crapped all over the hangman sounded like they'd been having problems with him doing that on purpose. And sir wasn't having any of it. While we were checking out the sights, I meant the Kishman lady, Sashi, Gomez smiled, leaning back in his chair, She's all exotic looking, named from the main parts of Ganlin, and the translation spell thing gave her an awesome accent too. He sighed, remembering her words when they first met. Go on. We spent the whole day together, talking and, uh, stuff. He smiled sheepishly. She's from Kanmoy, a small kingdom to the west. Well, used to be, he scratched his head. They got absorbed into Ganlin when the war broke out. She came here with her family, trying to get away from the problems back home. Then those problems caught up to them, and her pops got dragged back into Kamoi, leaving them behind. After the war broke out, her monk but sick and died, leaving her to take care of her baby sister and brother. Where were you when you got Bradford's message? Oh, I was still a seller. I was actually showing her my phone and telling her about it when I got the text. Who is seller? Oh, uh, Saisha. She, uh... She calls herself Sai Shi at work, but her real name is Sila. Sila Yin Tai. And what happened then? Sergeant Bradford spotted that Anyo guy in the crowd, and she fecking spares the feck out, and taking mad crazy, just went fecking ballistic, dove into the crowd after him, hauled his ass out, and bro, she beat the fecking shit out of him, fucking snuffed his goddamn face in, until two of her guys fecking um. Kowalski and the big one, the dumb one, don't know his name, took the both of them and hauled her off the dude. Sintelli leaned back, tapping his chest with both arms. I'm standing there, fingering my safety, thinking I'm about to have to go cyclic and keep my ass from getting pounded by a bunch of fursuits, but he threw his hands up. They just fucking stood there and watched it all happen. Crap's fucking whack, bro. 
I was out with Edison, Dubois, and Alda. We were checking out the local cuisine and shopping for souvenirs. Miller and Sampson at the market, and Bradford and Ayat were checking the shops. Kowalski, Kimber, the Gomez, and Stephens, though. I'm pretty sure they went to the brothel. They definitely smelled like sex and perfume when we all met up again. Where were you when Second Artificer Yacht was detained? That was, uh, what? Around 1500. Davies leaned back, looking up as he thought. We were probably at the other side of town. Around. Look, something that's been bothering me. Now, Yacht said that he couldn't find his unit. He thought that they were all dead. That's why he wandered over to our camp after the battle. Well, that doesn't make sense. Their lines are, what? Roughly equivalent to a battalion? There were hundreds of them there yesterday. They were obviously not wiped out. Did he actually try to fight them? Did he even actually know that they had survived? Or where they were? Smells kind of fishy to me. My lord, you're awake. I want her head, Anya tried to sit up. My lord, please, no, stay down. Hands pressed against his shoulders, keeping him from rising. You are still severely injured. Me lacked the strength to resist, and perhaps remaining in bed was best anyway. I want her head, he repeated. Whose head, my lord? The witch who did this, he said, barely lifting an arm to vaguely wave at himself. I want her head on a bike. My lord, I want her head, and I will have it, he growled through a grit of teeth, and her eyes served on a platter, roasted. He reached up and grabbed the healer's smock, surprising the young Kishman with his strength. You will send for a scribe immediately. He locked eyes with the man. The younger artificer's ear slowly whittled back against the skull under the heat of Anyo's gaze. I must write my father. Colonel Michaels looked up at the knock of his office door to find Major Winters standing in it, holding a small packet of archaic-looking papers, complete with wax seal. Got some mail for you, sir. The hell is that, Major? He asked, inviting her in with a slight nod. A real old-fashioned snail mail, sir, she said, chuckling as she walked through the door. No crap delivered by Pony Express ten minutes ago, she frowned. Well, it looked more like an elk than a horse, but it had the proper saddle and came complete with a young Kishman with a Gandalin Royal Courier Service. She turned, waving said Kishman into Michael's office, who refused to relinquish it to anyone but you or your immediate second-in-command, she pointed at herself, and who still insisted on seeing it delivered to you. The cream-speckled grey Kishman snapped at attention in front of the desk. My lord! He said, giving Michaels a small but crisp bow. I would be utterly remiss in my duties if I did not see the letter delivered. He straightened. The royal couriers always see the message through. At ease, son, Michaels said, taking the packet from Winters as she handed it to him. There are no lords here. Don't you say, my lord, the young Kishman said, shifting to an at ease post. Michaels snorted, inspecting the packing, smirking a bit of the old fashioned wax seal, then frowned as he studied the lettering. Well, this is going to be a problem. I don't suppose you can read, he asked the courier as he cracked the seal and opened the packet, pulling out the multi-page letter written in neat, blowing handwriting. Of course, my lord, the young man nodded. It is a requirement of the service. Good, Michael said, holding the papers up to him. You can read it to me, my lord, the Kishman's ears shut up. I am a courier. We are to deliver messages. Reading them is a violation of our code. That's all well and good, son, Michael said, giving him a patronizing frown. But I can't read your language. Oh, um, the courier blinked. Ah, right. His ears twitched. I suppose that, uh, he carefully took the letter. Such situations aren't unheard of. Good. Just one second, though, Michael said, bringing up a word processor on his laptop. Sergeant Ritters, he shouted past Winters into the courier. I need you in here. A moment later, his secretary poked his head in. You called, sir? Michael spun up a laptop around and pointed at one of the chairs in front of his desk. I need your typing skills, sir. I got a letter from the Kishman, but none of us can read their writing, so you're going to transcribe it for me. Aye, right, sir, Ritters said, glancing to the courier as he sat down and pulled the laptop a little closer to himself. Ready, I guess. The courier eyed the glowing screen of the laptop for a moment before flicking his ears and returning his attention to the letter at hand. He took a deep breath, then paused, turning the letter around to look at the envelope. To commander of the 2nd Battalion of the 5th Regiment of the 1st Marine Division of the United States Marine Corps, from Knight Captain Agyath Lyson, 
lie in command of the third line of the fifth regiment of the ninth banner of the Gandolin Royal Host. Well, Carol, what do you think? Michaels asked, looking over the handwritten letter and wondering if he could get it framed, or if it would have to be remitted as evidence. It was just two of them in his office now. The courier had left after ensuring Ritter's transcription was accurate, and Ritter had closed the doors on his way out. But the language is flowery is all fuck, and the first page is all introductory bullshit. But when he does get around to the point of the letter, the night captain Leshen guy doesn't beat around the bush. She leaned forward in her chair, scrolling through the document. Though Sergeant Bradford Bayer was brash and far beyond the pale of decorum and propriety of common soldier, it proved to be entirely warranted by the urgency and unique exigency of the situation, Winter snorted. Sergeant Bradford should be commended for taking prompt and decisive action to stop a gross miscarriage of justice and to save the life of one of the men under her command. She sat back. He gives a pretty glowing commendation of her apprehending the suspect attempted murderer, too, she chuckled. Though, he never actually mentions Anya by name. I noticed that, Michael said, sitting the letter on his desk. What's your read on that? I don't know, sir, Winter said. He very strongly emphasizes the guilt of the suspect, both making in false reports and calls it a blatant attempted murder. But he's careful not to actually identify Anya, except right here. She scrolled down and pointed at the passage in question. He very clearly describes him, but just never actually names him. She shook her head. It's some political bullcrap going on, sir. That it is, he sighed. Fortunately, or unfortunately, we aren't the ones who have to figure it out. This has gone way above our heads. They shared a mutual frown for a moment. Then Michael straightened, reaching over to pull his laptop back to his side of the desk. I'll follow this up the chain. Is there anything else, Major? No, sir. That's it for now. Very well, Major, he said, giving her a nod, an unspoken dismissal. Sir, she said, standing up, briefly bracing to attention before turning and walking out of his office. Anya stared at the ceiling, silently waiting for the human healer to leave. His skull ached, but the pain only fueled his determination. The scribe had left. His letter swore to be delivered, but the healer had also gone to consult with the human doctors, leaving him with just the human nurses and attendants. He clenched his teeth as a wave of pain rolled from his brow to his snout. The humans had given him something for the pain. That it did help. But both they and the propaganda healer were extremely cautious of what and how much to give him, so it only dulled the pain. As the wave passed, he sighed. Of course, we finally received something resembling an appropriate staff for our situation. I'm still stuck around surrounded by humans. He flicked back an ear. At least I can take some solace in that this insult will soon be answered. The door to his room opened, and he recognized the tread of a single pair of finely made leather boots. A glance at the window across from the door showed Yashay's reflection stepping into the room, and the human attendant stepping out. Your grace, he said still staring at the ceiling. Forgive me if I don't sit up, but the healer has instructed me to lie still and rest. Of course, Lord Anio, the duke said. I was given a report of your injuries. They were um, quite severe. He paused, and Anio could see the slight twitch in his ear as his mind's eye. If not for human medicine, it is likely that you would not have survived. If not for human insubordination, I would not have suffered them in the first place. That is quishy shit, and you know it, Telmu. Your Grace, I... You were pursuing your personal quibble against Second Art Advisor Ayat, against my explicit instructions. Yishay snapped. You have defied my orders, made yourself a would-be murderer, and endangered our alliance with the humans. Do you wish to be made an enemy of the ground? Your Grace, Anya snarled, pushing himself to sit up, but only got halfway before he was halted by the Duke's glare. We need them, Yushe growled, his voice low with an icy edge. I will do whatever it is necessary for the sake of the kingdom. Right now, we need this alliance. It is the only thing keeping the elves from exterminating us. The humans don't need us. Without them, we die. He leaned forward, his presence looming over Anya even from across the room. So I'll do whatever it takes to secure the alliance with the humans, to secure the future of the kingdom. And if that means giving them your head on a platter, Lord Anyo, I will not hesitate. The duke straightened, and with only two steps, stepped through the door with the weight of a monsoon. 
he left Anya staring after him in silence, broken only by the human contraption incessantly beeping in time with his heartbeat. Fact man, how many more rounds of interrogation are we going to have to go through? Kimber asked as the squad trudged down the long hall after another day of grilling. Hey, at least they're letting us talk to each other again, Edison said. That's a good sign, right? Samson asked. I think so, Dubois said. Yeah, we didn't really do nothing wrong before we went to After Shields, and he'd be died if we hadn't. Gomez scuffed his boot against the concrete floor of the hall. That Anya fuckwood obviously was up to some fecky crap. They gotta realize that. Hopefully this will bow over soon. Nah, bruh, we still gotta do the safety stand down. Kowalski said. Ah, oh, fuck, man. Safety stand down? Red asked, quirking his ear. He had heard it mentioned before, but never bothered to ask. Yep, all the stops, and we spend the whole day in safety briefs and workshops and lectures, talking about our feelings and bullshit, Kowalski said. His voice turned froggy at the end by a hiccough. <sighs> you would know, you've caused most of them in the whole battalion, Dubois said, pushing open the door leading to the squad out of the building. Hey, only half, Kowalski pointed a finger at his own defense. Rin flicked up an ear, his spirits lifted as a little as his squad laughed at Kowalski's antics. But his left ear dipped in Bradford's direction as he noticed her lack of reaction. She's been withdrawn since we got picked up on Sunday. Both ears dipped as he pondered her anxiety. They all looked up at the chest filled rumble of an unfamiliar aircraft roaring overhead. His ears flicked back up in awe at the enormous double hulled craft. How can they make something like that fly? What the feck is that? Kimber said. Holy crap, Edison said. Is that... Huh, Bradford said. I'll be damned. That's a fecking strata launch. A strata what the feck? Kowalski said. A strata launch, Bradford said, the corner of her mouth twitching up as she watched the giant plane climb into the distance. It's an air launch system. It carries rockets under the wing between the two nacelles. She pointed at the retreating craft, still visible despite the distance. That thing had four rockets underneath. She showed the first smile Rin had seen from her in days. We're putting satellites in orbit. Hot oh, damn, Edison said. About fucking time. So, um, like a uh, satellite recon and crap, Kimber asked. Eh, maybe, Edison shrugged. Probably not yet, though. Probably pure science collection stuff. But might be stuff that could double as spy stats. He shook his head. Won't get much coverage with four. But that thing was supposed to be cancelled. If they're throwing money at it to make it operational, you can bet your rear more will be coming. Fuck yeah, Kemba said. Let's see the cablers hide from us now. What are satellites? Rin asked, his ears cocked in confusion to match his frown. Oh, bro, Edison said, throwing an arm over his shoulder as they headed back to the barracks. Allow me to blow your mind. End of part one. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click, click, click. With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I would just like to give a quick thanks to the T5 channel members and patrons. Alithia, Parky, Feudic Yol, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Angry Marine, Lord Azrakal, and White Van 420